Welcome to the Acrylic Portrait Painting Challenge Masterclass, lesson number four, painting the first few layers. Hey, I hope you're doing well. Thank you for joining me again for another lesson. And in this lesson here, we're gonna continue on where we left off um, adding the first layers of paint to our sketch. Now we already have the sketch sealed in. Uh, we added a toning layer to kind of shift it from being just a uh, straight white and giving it a little bit of a, a jump start on the skin tones and then some of the other colors that's going to be uh, evident in the final painting. Um, but I'm excited you're here and I'm going to be showing you the next steps on this portrait. But first of all, before we go into anything else, I just want to say you can do this. So if you're struggling with anything related to the sketch or any of the process so far, I'd like you to leave me a comment below ask me a question, go to our Realistic Acrylic Portraits group, ask a question there, and I'll be happy to answer that for you. And other students, many of them will as well. So there's, there's gonna be struggles when you paint. There's gonna be struggles when you try something new. Um, anytime you step out in faith, that faith is gonna be tested, and it's just part of the process. So I wanna encourage you, nothing wrong with you. Uh, if you are encountering some difficulties, uh, but just continue on, persevere through the challenges, and you're gonna become a better artist for that, even a better person, a more resilient person, for actually having stuck through the challenges, and then coming out the other side with a portrait you can be proud of. All right, so now, if you haven't signed up for the challenge, maybe you just joined this, this video, you, you just, hopped on YouTube and you saw this video pop up and you're like, I don't know who this Matt Filio guy is or what this challenge is. Well, if you're an artist who wants to paint a portrait, you're in the right place because we've done several challenges in the past few years and I've seen many artists who could never paint a portrait, never thought they could paint a portrait, um, paint a beautiful portrait their very first try. Now, does that happen every time? No. Some artists, it does take several tries to really get that skill um, kind of get the brain working in a certain way to be able to see things and realistically portray it. However, I've seen many artists just with the instruction we give here, their first time they're painting a beautiful portrait they can be proud of. Um, and maybe that would be you. Either way, whether it takes you a very little amount of time or a longer amount of time, if you have the desire to paint a portrait, you can do it. All you need is some instruction and all you need is some practice. And if you have the desire, that means that your brain is already working along those paths of being able to see something in nature and capture that on a canvas on a two-dimensional surface. So take the challenge. It's completely free. You can do that below. I have a link in the description of the video, um, also in the top comments. It's at realisticacrylic.com forward slash acrylic dash portrait dash painting dash challenge. When you sign up, I'll send you the welcome kit that includes everything you need to paint along with us, the reference photo with and without the grid, the supplies list, the palette layout guide, and the upcoming masterclass schedule. And I'll also send you all the classes right to your email inbox. You won't miss a single one, and you'll know as soon as they come out. So I'd love to have you take part of the challenge. I invite you to do that. Again, it's completely free. Uh, so go ahead and sign up right now and we'll get you started with everything you need to paint along with us, all right? Okay, so let's dive in here with a word of prayer and then we're gonna get right into the lesson. Um, Father, I ask a blessing on this portrait class today. I need your help to be able to do this well. Apart from you, I can do nothing. With you, I can do all things. So Lord, I pray that you would use my hands, um, that you would paint through me in this sense and you would bless the students, Lord. I pray that um, you would, again, give them the confidence that they can do this, that they can paint a portrait that they'll be proud of, um, and that they would push through any of the obstacles, any of the challenges, and persevere, because, Lord, there's a reward when we persevere. Um, I pray that everything would be clear. I pray if anybody's uh, struggling with sickness or any sort of injuries, that you would heal that in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, by your stripes we are healed. Um, so bless this lesson today. Amen. And that does remind me, um, 
God has supernaturally healed my hand. I'm going to share more about that on a separate YouTube video. But all I'm going to say is uh, a little over a week ago, I injured my painting hand and God completely healed it. And I thank him for that. But I don't want to take up too much time talking about that. Check out my other video where I explain more about how that happened. Let's get into the lesson. And uh, yeah, so to begin, step number one. Step number one is going to be blocking in the most dominant values. Blocking in the most dominant values. So here we have our sketch and we've got the reference photo. And what you want to do is just kind of look at your reference photo and study it for a little bit before you even start to put paint on your canvas and ask yourself, what is the most dominant color and value? So, um, and we're looking more in terms of value than color. What's the kind of the darkest color, the most dominant area? And when I look at this image, I'm, I'm seeing that clothing. So with the glazing technique, and I'm gonna be teaching you this using the glazing technique. It's a time-honored method of putting on many, many translucent layers of paint, mixing a little bit of paint with a lot of matte medium. Okay, if you're new to this channel and you, you're not sure what glazing is, I'll teach you in this, this masterclass. So that's how we're gonna approach this portrait is by beginning very, very lightly and just slowly adding um, minute, or I should say very faint layers of paint. Think of it, I've used this metaphor before, but think of it like a Polaroid camera. Um, you remember those old Polaroid cameras and they would take a picture and you would get a little white piece of paper, a little piece of film, and there'd be nothing on it, but soon enough you'd see a image start to materialize right before your eyes and it would fade in very slowly and over the course of a minute you'd have a beautiful picture right there in front of you. Well, that's what we want to do with this painting. We want to slowly add some glazes and because we're mixing that little bit of paint and dispersing it, with this clear matte medium. Now it looks milky white, but it dries crystal clear, okay? We take little bits of paint and we disperse it into that medium and that makes it very, very translucent. And then as we apply it to our canvas, um, it allows us a lot of freedom, a lot of flexibility. It allows us to make some subtle changes. So uh, if you make a mistake, it's no big deal because you can always pivot from any mistakes you make because it's so light and then it's easy just to shift the color in the next layer. If you don't get it right in the first layer, you can move towards getting it right in the second layer. If you add a little bit of shading where you shouldn't have, no big deal, then you just darken another area around that area and suddenly it looks more natural. Um, I think the best way to explain this to you is to actually do it. I just want to kind of give you a little bit of um, a taste of it beforehand um, so you kind of get the concepts down before we actually paint. But step number one is to identify that darkest area because we want to create contrast right away. All right, that's, that's really what we're shooting for. Value is king. Value is more important than color. Let's look for the contrast. And that contrast is between your clothing and the background, the clothing and the palette, the clothing and her face. That's, that's what we're looking at. So let's go ahead and render that on our canvas. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go over the colors really quickly. I know I have them uh, listed in our palette layout guide and in the supplies list, but really quick. Just going to go through a rundown of our colors. We've got raw umber dark. Now, I do have ivory black here, but we're not going to use that. That was for a different painting. Um, raw umber dark, burnt sienna, raw sienna. Uh, we have uh, thalo blue, ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, um, naphthal red, pyrrole orange, Indian yellow, and titanium white. And then last but not least, we have some matte medium as well. Uh, so these are the colors we're using. And then the brushes we'll be using, I believe, I could be wrong, maybe there'll be uh, some other ones I'll pick, but we are going to be using a, a half inch 
sorry, a half inch flat <laughs> and a one inch flat. Um, so these are the brushes we're going to be using, golden taclon or a synthetic bristle. Okay, let's go ahead and dive in to the painting process. I appreciate your patience. I just want to explain everything so you know what's going on. Okay, let's go to the palette. And what we want to do is mix a color uh, that's going to work for her clothing. And we can keep it pretty simple. Um, I think just two colors will do the trick. Okay, so let's take a little bit ultramarine blue. What I like to do is just dip my brush in the corner. Just get a little bit on the bristles. And then I dab it off to the side next to my matte medium and I kind of wipe it away so that there's not too much on the edge of the bristles. And you can see I just have a little bit saturated there. Then I actually go ahead and I bring my brush into a corner, just into the edge of that matte medium and that way I can control the amount of paint that's dispersed into the medium. One of the biz biggest mistakes that I see with artists that just begin with this technique as I've taught it in person and I can observe what the artists are doing is they often mix way too much paint into their matte medium. You want to make sure you're just using a little bit and if you're used to painting more opaquely takes a little bit of time to get used to this, so cut yourself some slack um, as you're learning it. But try to go way, way lighter than what you think. Okay, so again, very, very faint. Okay, we're looking at a ratio of about 95% matte medium to 5% paint. And I'm gonna show you what this looks like. First, let me add my second color. Um, and let's, take some raw sienna. So ultramarine blue and raw sienna, mix them together and this is going to give us a good uh, foundation color for her clothing. Um, kind of a desaturated um, bluish, or well kind of a desaturated army green almost I guess. And that's the color that I'm seeing. All right so we're mixing these together. I'm pulling in a little more raw sienna into the mix. And now I want to show you what this looks like on a white card. I have a white card below here. Let's just kind of scroll down to that. And this is what our glaze looks like. Now you can see how faint that is. This is what I would like it to look like uh, when you're starting out. Just very, very faint. Now because I used ultramarine blue and raw sienna, they're not very vibrant. You know, I could have used thalo blue, and thalo blue is more of a turquoise, kind of blue-green blue. -green blue. Um, that would have given us a more vibrant green, or if I had mixed thalo blue and Indian yellow, again, that would have given us a very vibrant green that you would almost use for grass, trees, and foliage, and things like that. But it would not have been as appropriate for this really kind of desaturated green we see here. See the color of her clothing has a greenish hue but it's not very strong. Not not very strong at all. And so just by point of comparison, oh what do we have? Uh, let's see. I'll grab something. This is a stapler. Okay now look at how bright this stapler is. <clears throat> that would be captured by using phthalo blue and Indian yellow which on my palette this is our thalo blue, and then this is the Indian yellow. See, those are the vibrant colors that we would use if we were trying to capture the color of this. But we're not, we're trying to capture that. And that's much more, again, subdued, much more desaturated of a color. Um, and so, this is why I'm choosing ultramarine blue and raw sienna. All right, so all that explanation I know, we just want to get to painting, but I've got to explain a few things just if you're new to the glazing technique and the way I mix colors. Now let's uh, go ahead and we'll begin. So we're going to start on the left side, okay, because I'm right-handed. If you're left-handed, you might work differently. But I'm going to start on the left-hand side and I'm going to go ahead and use some moderate pressure and I'm going to bring this glaze 
all the way across. You can see how light we're going. It's just barely making a difference. You want to make sure you go all the way up to the edge. If you go over the lines, no big deal. I'd rather that you go over the lines than not go all the way up to the lines. Now try to, <clears throat> what you want to do, excuse me, is try to work in sections. Let's scroll that camera down just a bit. So we're just getting uh, the area of her clothing. All right, work in sections and always keep a wet edge. Once you have this area filled in, don't brush it again. Uh, if you have it smoothed out, leave it alone because when you overbrush it, that's when things get blotchy. All right, now notice how I'm turning my brush this way and that way. Just work in little sections. Now we go ahead and we're going to cut up along the edge of that palette because that's a good decisive edge. And see, I'm picking up my brush. Now I've got this whole section nice and smooth. This obviously is an edge I need to continue working while it's wet. I'm going to dip my brush back into the mix, back into this glaze. And then we're going to continue on all the way up to the edge. All right. And I can also brush down vertically to smooth things out. So I get rid of some of those little areas that are rough. The glazing technique is a wonderful way to overcome some of the limitations of acrylic where acrylic dries so fast and it's so hard to blend. All right, I'm just going to do a glaze running all the way across and kind of smooth that out a little bit. I can also bring this glaze a little bit into her hair, only into the darker areas. We don't want to bring it into the lighter areas because the color won't work. We need more of a uh, vibrant color, a more of a reddish, brownish, goldenrod color uh, to show the blonde brownish hair that she's got. I'm going to flip the brush over and sometimes you can get more paint off by flipping it over. Notice how I'm using a good amount of pressure to get it into the weave of the canvas. I'm holding my brush kind of toward the midpoint and I'm pushing more perpendicular to really make sure it gets into the grooves of the canvas. And when I have it in there, I smooth it out. Um, so you can see kind of how this looks with this beginning section. Okay, I just missed that little area by her hand and if I massage it in gently, I can do that without disturbing the rest. Um, but notice how I've got this whole area um, that has a decisive edge. I went all the way up to the lines. I didn't go shy of the lines. Um, all the way up to the lines and I went over in a couple spots but that's no big deal because we can always correct that later. I've got a whole section finished. Now, I'm going to just move that camera down a bit, and we're going to get that bottom section. See, if you stop at a, a stopping point right here, this, this palette breaks up this whole shape. And so if I just stay within the shape and make sure I'm working along from left to right, smoothing everything out as I go along, now I can be assured that I've got a nice, smooth, even application and I can go to this next section. This is a whole, even though this is the dress, that area there is a whole distinct shape. So I can treat this as a separate shape, but I still have the glaze. So I can dip back into my glaze here. And sometimes you do have to mix up a little more. So I just kind of ran out. I'm gonna pull a little bit of raw sienna from this corner. Now notice I'm not pulling it from the whole lineup of colors on the edge because then I'll get too much on my brush and I won't be able to control the opacity. In other words, I won't be able to control how, um, how much paint is in the mixture. And the mixture will get way too filled with paint and there won't be enough matte medium. But no, I have a little dab off to the side, little dab of blue, little dab of raw sienna. I can pull from that in a very controlled way. And I can pull a little bit from there. All right, and I can bring it back in and notice I've got some matte medium that has nothing mixed into it. So you don't want to mix it into the whole thing. You always want to have some that's not affected by your mix. You can always control the ratio of matte medium to paint. And this area here is where you control it. This is where it all happens. So you're mixing it, pulling it back in. All right, so I can basically kind of recreate that whole color again 
and it doesn't have to be perfect. But let's go ahead and try it out on the white card and see if we've got it. All right, so you can see, I'm just going to move it down a little bit, that we've got pretty good uh, replication of that initial color. All right, but if you don't have a perfect replication, no big deal, because we're going to be doing lots of layers and you'll have many opportunities to get it right. Many opportunities. And painting just reminds me so much of a metaphor of life. How, you know, I've often made mistakes, I've sinned, and God has been so merciful to me, so kind. He's given me so many chances to make things right. You know, if I messed up on, on a day and I just had a bad day, <laughs> you know, I was not <clears throat> treating my wife as well as I should have, or I you know, got a little short-tempered or didn't work on the things I should have worked on, whatever. Well, I can ask for forgiveness to God and to anybody I've affected. And there's the next day. The next day is an opportunity to do it better. And uh, I'm thankful for that. I'm so thankful for that. There's always forgiveness in Jesus. There's always opportunity for a, a fresh start. So you'll have many opportunities to get this right, so don't stress about it. Just make your glazes as light as you can. They're not probably not going to look quite as smooth as this, but they might. They might. You know, it's possible you could get a nice even application. We have some artists in our school that are known for their super sfumato smooth applications of paint with a glazing technique. And uh, but if it's not this smooth, okay, if you have a little bit of blotchiness, that's normal. Don't worry about it, just keep on adding more layers. As you add more layers, brushing in different directions, it'll all kind of smooth out in the end if you stick with it and follow what I teach. Okay, so that was the first layer. I know we did this super, super slow, but I just want to kind of show you that part of it. And uh, what I like to do is actually kind of reuse a color. So I'm going to set this brush off to the side here in my water container and I'm going to grab the half inch flat. Well, it's actually more like five eighths, you know, if we want to be accurate about it. But I'm going to go ahead and um, kind of reactivate this glaze by pulling more into the mix. Okay, so a little more raw sienna, a little more ultramarine blue. And uh, what we're going to do is just kind of use this color and uh, we're going to create some color continuity by employing this um, into her hair. So let's go ahead and, and put this into the hair. I'll just pull the camera up really quick. And let's go ahead and add this glaze just to the shadowed areas only. All right, so now remember I said don't put this in their hair. Well, you can put it in her, in her hair only if you put it in the darkest spots and make sure the glaze is really, really faint. All right, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you really can see where I'm putting this in. I'm placing it just within the areas that I designated as shadows. And again, you want this to be very faint, about 95% matte medium, 5% paint. If what you're putting down is looking too dark, wipe it off with a wet rag. I just want to have a wet rag handy. I've got one right here, this towel, but just uh, have kind of a damp rag or some sort of a rag where if it's too dark, wipe it off and try again. All right. Um, but we're going, we're putting this glaze down here and then this is going to, I want to make sure I don't get too much of that color next to her ear. I want to have this actually just in the middle. All right. So I just kind of wipe that down because the, the color gets saturated right by her um, left cheek. So I just want that right to the left of that. And again, we're just using this glaze in these sections in the hair. Now, I'm gonna also put a little bit of that glaze here on her neck. Let's move the camera over. And you might wonder, you know, why I'm using the glaze, oh, Hold on a second, I gotta get this hole filled in and uh, a little bit right there. So why am I using the color of her shirt elsewhere? Uh, why am I using that color that we use for her shirt 
in her hair. And the reason I do that is I like to promote a sense of color cohesion and harmony. And if I can take this same color and reintroduce it somewhere else, um, it tends to make the painting look more uh, unified as a whole because those layers do shine through. You know, you, in the glazing technique, you've got light shining through these layers of, of paint dispersed by matte medium, reflecting off the white of the canvas and then back to your eye. So you're gonna see all of these layers of, as an optical mix. They all work synergistically together to create that sense of depth and that sense of vibrancy uh, that really you can't get any other way with acrylic as far as I've experienced. And uh, anyway, all that to say that we wanna have the color cohesive. So if we take this color here and disperse it elsewhere, we'll have a sense of color harmony. And it just looks more unified and it gives you a better visual presentation uh, that uh, in the end kind of works out to looking like a better portrait. Okay, I'm gonna add a little bit of this glaze up here um, on the background, again, to promote some color cohesion. And I'm gonna switch back to that larger brush. Probably in retrospect should have done that before I uh, put it in the water container, but that's okay. I'm just gonna get this glaze reactivated. Try to manufacture that same color I had before. Now, as I teach this uh, process here, I usually go, let's just take the wide view, there we go. I usually go just a little bit slower than what I actually paint in. So when I'm actually painting uh, without teaching, I'm doing all this way, way faster. I slow down the process just so that you can see what I'm doing and I explain it. And I, the reason I mention that is just so that you understand that the glazing technique is not nearly as slow as you might think. Um, I can get a painting done when I'm not teaching uh, in about 10 to 20 hours, uh, like a 16 by 20. So it, it doesn't have to take super, super long. But we're putting in just a little bit of this same color. Yep, the same color of her clothing in the background. Again, I just want to kind of reuse it and uh, have it all work together synergistically. And I think that's good. Now let's go ahead and um, darken a couple of smaller areas. So within this first layer, we want to make sure we're not only getting the large areas, but some of the small parts as well for maximum color unity and cohesion. Uh, let's work on some areas around her eyes and her brushes. So we're treating this uh, dark value um, as and let me show you here on the palette as something we want to apply to even the paint brushes. Okay, so this, this color here on her clothing happens to be kind of a cool tone, fortunately. So we can employ that actually on the paint brushes, all in the shadowed areas. So if you look at the reference photo, you've got some parts that are quite dark. We want to think of that as being more than just paint brushes. We want to see these shapes. We've got a long, skinny, rectangular shape here. And we have another almost triangular shape right there. And so what we're going to do then is we're going to portray um, these areas by using this dark glaze and beginning that process. If it doesn't make sense, all right, just uh, suspend disbelief for a little bit or put that aside. Um, but just go ahead and paint it like I'm teaching it because there is a reason for that. And eventually it'll click. It will make sense. So again, we're going to just dial those parts in. And then on her face, this is another area too that we want to think about. And that is that all the dark areas we see, uh, the eyelid, areas around the iris and eye, shadows, like you have a strong shadow under her eyelid, little crevices around her mouth. These are all areas where we actually can use this glaze because their ultimate value and that is how dark they're going to get. It's very, very close to black. And so again, this first glaze we're using, this kind of sage color, ultimately can achieve that very dark value that's close to black. And again, it'll all make sense after you use this technique enough. Um, if you're beginning this technique, you're new to it, just follow along and it'll eventually click. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to 
get a little more ultramarine blue. I kind of ran out of it and a little more of this raw sienna. Just kind of set that off to the side here. And we'll go ahead and mix a little bit more of this glaze. Now, a lot of times I would use raw umber dark for my very first glaze. Uh, if you followed me for a while, you're probably amazed that I haven't used raw umber dark right away. This might be the first time. I don't know. But this is the color we're using, and we're going to stick with that. Again, creating that sage color. Now, we will have to go just a little bit more opaque um, than we have in the past, just because we're using a small round brush. So uh, I thought maybe we would only use the flats that one inch and half inch flat, but you will need to grab a small round. This is a size six. Um, so something like this will work well. And then this is what the glaze looks like. It's a little more opaque, maybe about 90 or 85% matte medium to 10 to 15% paint. Um, and we're gonna go ahead then and use that on these specific areas I'm talking about. So let's go ahead and apply that onto the brushes. Again, getting those darker forms right in here. And again, we're just creating a nice sense of color cohesion by using the same color throughout. It's almost painting monochromatic in a way, but not really. I'm not doing a grisaille where you'd go monochromatic, but it probably seems that way. So we'll bring this glaze up into the shadow of that brush, not into the other one into the side, a little bit into the shadow, kind of fade it away like that. You can also get into these shadows um, around the fingers. Okay, so in between the fingers, that's almost a black value. So wherever it's gonna be really dark, we wanna add those shadows there. And then now let's uh, go ahead and we'll move up to her face and we want to get uh, those areas represented as well. So let's go ahead and do that. And we're going to start by putting in a little bit of a glaze um, just on the area around the perimeter of her eyes. So really, you want to look closely where I'm placing this, and I'm going to zoom right in so you really can see it. Again, you want that glaze to be pretty light Notice I'm putting it in the interior of the eye. I'm putting it a little bit in the shadow part. All right, so just running it along. I'm using short little brush strokes. And I'm gonna fade it away at the end. I'm, I'm not gonna fill in the whole eye, but I'm actually just placing it around the edges and I'm just lightly, lightly feathering that in. Probably seems like it's not making much of a difference, but it is. It's getting us started along this path of kind of fading in the painting like a Polaroid photograph. So just in those crevices. All right, so with that, we've got a little bit of a darker value being rendered. So when you zoom out, it's just, it's basically darkening certain spots more than others. And that's, that's how we do that. So um, with that now, uh, step number one is complete. Now we want to move on to step number two. Uh, in step number two, what we want to do is look for that second most dominant color. So where we use that kind of sage green color in step one, we're going to be diving in with the next most dominant color. So. Go ahead and study your reference photo. Ask yourself what the next most dominant color is. And what I'm seeing is this kind of golden color of the palette and the golden color of her hair, which are very similar. So let's go ahead and glaze that in. We'll go ahead and take our flat brush, bring that out of retirement, take that out of our water container, rinse it off really, really well. I just like to take a rag here and wipe my brush on the rag so I don't have any water dripping out of the heel of the brush onto my canvas. And then we use this matte medium we've got on the side and we're going to uh, pull in 
first of all, some raw sienna. And I just want to ask myself, just for the sake of keeping things simple, and because we already have raw sienna represented in the rest of the painting, I think I'm just going to only use raw sienna for this first glaze, just to keep things very simple. We want to start simple and go complex. All right, so we have a very light glaze. Again, notice how I, I put off that raw sienna to the side and I'm controlling the mixture, bringing it in, keeping a little bit of matte medium unaffected, but just mixing into this section here and trying to create um, something that's, again, about 95% um, matte medium, 5% paint. We're gonna go ahead and apply that to her hair and to the palette. So this is going to be very light. And because it's very light, it's going to give us a little bit of leeway where we can shift the color where need be. So we're going to apply it to the hair. Now I want to make a distinction that there are some areas where the background color is kind of shining through. And so we do want to um, leave those areas more vacant. I'm going to zoom out just a bit so you can see the reference photo. Let's just shift this a little bit that way. There we go. And again, if you look at your reference photo, you've got some areas where the light is shining through here and here. Those are negative spaces. So we kind of want to leave them alone and not paint on them if we can help it. I do want to bring the paint down to this point, but here I want that, I want the background color to shine through. And with this light glaze, it's hard to really see the difference, but I want to steer it in that direction as much as possible. Over here on this side, again, we've kind of got some thin, wispy strands of hair. We don't want to put too much glaze there. We want to keep it more in the larger shapes. And we just want to see this whole thing as a shape. Okay, so now let's go ahead and shift down to the palette. We're going to use the same color, just again, promote that sense of color harmony. Just use the same exact color again. And we'll go ahead and start on the left side, work our way over to the right. If you use a little more brush pressure, you can actually get more color to come out. So uh, be careful with that because you can end up getting a little blotchy if you squeeze the brush too hard. So it's good to kind of dip your brush back into the mix, get it saturated again, so you're not pulling out that color from the heel of the brush too much. And we'll just kind of continue keeping that wet edge. Let's move the camera down so you really can see what's happening here. Okay, we're just going to glaze right over this. We'll kind of brush in the direction horizontally because you know it's a wood grain and it just makes sense that the wood actually would have that kind of uh, wood grain going across. In fact if you look at your reference photo you'll see the direction of the wood grain is like this. Alright so you want to kind of brush in that direction or at least finish your brush strokes in that direction to mimic that sense of the wood grain. Now, if you go over the edges and you go into the clothing, uh, that is no big deal because that's actually uh, has some of that color in it anyway. All right, so I wanna really smooth this out, not over brush it, just make sure I've got it even as possible. Squeeze in a little more matte medium on the bottom. And here's a little trick. Um, if you're starting to dig into the painting where the, the brush kind of gets those little lap marks and little gouge marks where the paint's kind of getting dug out of you know, the grooves of your canvas by too much brush work, if you hold your brush more perpendicular, or I should say, sorry, more parallel to the canvas, um, if you see kind of how I'm holding it here, you can actually smooth it out and it won't dig in as much. If you hold it like this perpendicular to the canvas, it'll really dig in and you'll see those marks. This kind of approach is good for when you're first brushing on, when you're just beginning um, to apply the paint and you need to get it into the weave of the canvas. But as you're smoothing it out, you want to shift that angle of your brush 
to being more parallel with the canvas's edge, if that makes sense. And you'll find it works a lot better. All right, so um, as I look at this then, that concludes step number two. And so now our step number three would be to block in the background glaze, which we've actually kind of done. Um, so I'm going to just basically take the same brush. Yeah, let's take the same brush and just bring some of that glaze that we put down for her hair into that. So step number two and three kind of kind of go right together. They're not two very distinct steps. Uh, but we'll go ahead and we'll just uh, get some more paint here on the brush. More of that same glaze we just did for her hair and her palette. And uh, we'll go ahead and incorporate just a little bit of that into the background. Um, let's get that first camera view. There we go. And we'll just go ahead and put a little bit of it, making a distinction. We want to look at the reference photo and see that it occurs right here. Um, it's not, you don't want to go everything the same. All right, and it's a little bit right up here. Now this side we want to have a little cooler in tone, so I'm not going to put it there because there I used that sage color, which had some ultramarine blue present. Um, what I want to do is just put it in a few key areas. Um, I'm looking at my reference photo. I see a little bit more of a yellowish tone in a few areas like here and here. Um, I see it down here a little bit. So we'll put it in there and there. A little bit right here. I'll just kind of smooth that out a bit. Okay, and that's it. So this is where we're at. And the first step, all I want you to do is just kind of set the stage and get very familiar, very comfortable as much as possible within you know this one lesson. Uh, get familiar and get comfortable with the glazing technique and how it works. So we're starting off simple and all we did was just basically apply a couple different mixes, basically two different mixes. Our first mix was uh, ultramarine blue and raw sienna and a lot of matte medium. Our second mix was just raw sienna, that's it. And we applied those two different mixes strategically to develop a sense of contrast and also a sense of the color scheme that's gonna be taking place in this painting. Uh, so this is the, this is the foundation. Um, I do see one little spot I missed, and I want to make sure you're set up for success here, so let's, let's address that quick. Let's put in a little bit of this raw sienna mix. We can add a little more raw sienna uh, than what we had before. And I'll show this to you also on the white card. All right, so you can kind of see what this looks like next to our other blazes. All right, I'll be doing that from time to time, just kind of showing you what things look like. But let's go ahead and just add this glaze on that one brush right here. So that has a little bit of a yellowish tint to it and a little bit on the top. All right, so that, that'll do it. Okay, so now for sure we are done here with um, all three steps and that concludes this lesson but there's a lot more to come <laughs> so this is the the end of lesson four we still have lessons five six seven and eight and you're going to see things moving really quickly as we get in between uh, lessons like five six and seven they'll be moving very fast when we get between lessons six and seven um, now there will be some bonus videos that I'll be putting into the Realistic Acrylic All Access Membership. I can't include everything um, in this lesson just because of the uh, limitations of YouTube. Um, so I'll be doing a lot of extra footage there. It will all be available in the All Access Membership. But I'm gonna be showing you the, the most important parts that are necessary for you to be able to paint this portrait with confidence. And it'll all be upcoming here in lessons uh, five, six, seven, and eight. So in lesson five, we'll be diving in, doing more layers, um, adding some darker values, getting contrast, working in the skin tones, step by step, uh, just one layer at a time. 
and you'll see a beautiful painting materialize right before your eyes. So that, that's um, what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to seeing your portraits. I'd like you to go ahead and share your painting in our Facebook group. And remember, we do have a critique coming up. So um, as I record this lesson, uh, we'll be having a live critique on uh, June 8th, I believe, if I remember correctly, June 8th, and that's uh, a Thursday. So you wanna make sure that you take part in that critique June 8th at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, and we'll be getting together to take a look at your work and helping you overcome any challenges uh, that you might have in your portrait and taking you to the next step. So uh, join that critique, enter your work into the Facebook group. Um, there's a post there where you can enter it. If you have any questions, get a hold of me here via the comments below. And uh, in the Facebook group, I'll be happy to help. Post your progress, please post your progress of your portrait in our Facebook group so others are encouraged that they can do this and that you can get the help you need um, going forward. And I hop in there as much as I can to give feedback. We have a lot of other artists doing the same thing. So look forward to seeing your progress on this. Great job, high fives for um, just going with this as far as you've gotten today. And it's just gonna get better and better as you go along. So. God bless you. I look forward to teaching you more. Get a hold of me at realisticacrylic.com for more tutorials um, and lessons and take part in the challenge through the link below. And uh, look forward to seeing you with this portrait, seeing it progress, teaching you more. God bless. We'll talk to you soon.